So welcome back, everyone. Uh, and for those of us, uh, for those of you who are just joining us now, I'm Valerie Paley, director of the Center for, the, for Women's History at the New York Historical Society. We're pleased to see you here at the second annual Diane and Adam Emax Conference in Women's History. Right now, I'm delighted to announce the launch of the first full-length Massive Open Online course, or MOOC, uh, on the history of women in America. When it debuts this week, it will be free and open to all on the edX platform. A co-production of our center with Columbia University, the two-part course introduces students to historians' work to uncover the place of women and gender in America's past. Our promotional campaign for the Center for Women's History is History Has a New Story. It sounds good, and it's actually accurate uh, as we are rolling out our new fourth floor, a fourth story, if you will, in the coming weeks. But the story of women in the past, in fact, is nothing new. It's a story as old as the story of the world itself. The work of women's historians to champion its relevance in the grand scheme of history writ large is part of the focus of our MOOC. Here to introduce a short clip is Alice Kessler Harris, its featured professor. She is or R. Gordon Hoxie Professor of American History Emerita at Columbia and chairwoman of our scholarly advisory committee. Alice. I'm not going to talk for very long, but I wanted to just say a couple of words before you see what will be a trailer for the MOOC, which is nothing like the MOOC itself. So this massive open online course is probably mislabeled from all kinds of perspectives. It, it, what we tried to do in this course, and the we in this case was Columbia's Center for Technology and Learning and the New York Historical Society, and especially Valerie Paley, who has been, um, what's, what's the word, engineering how we've proceeded all the way through and making things simple for us is to sort out how to present a history of woman, women online, uh, not to people who are in a classroom, not necessarily for people taking certificates, but for people who just want to know what they want to know. So the course is modular. Uh, you can start at the beginning and move to the end, the colonial period to the present, uh, or you can uh, decide that you're interested in one theme or another. So one of our favorite themes is coverture and how it emerges and how it dissipates or starts to dissipate in the 20th uh, and 21st centuries. Uh, and then there are many other themes, uh, labor, uh, economic uh, issues, of course, political participation, and so on. And because it's modular and because it's open access, you can, uh, anyone can, and I hope you all will, uh, look at any piece of it at any time uh, just for fun, you know, and there you will see two different kinds, well, more than two different kinds of things, but two main kinds of things. Uh, I do a lot of talking in the MOOC, uh, sort of mini lectures and introductions around particular aspects of women's history. But my favorite part is that we manage to bring in a dozen, perhaps 14, major historians of women some of whom are familiar to you and some of you you'll see on the screen in a moment, each of them talking about their own experiences with their expertise in women's history. So here you will be presented or what will be open to you will be the history of women uh, writ large or the history of women in whatever modules tempt you at the moment. Uh, the course is going online on Wednesday, and uh, outside you'll find a leaflet that looks like this. Pick one up, and you'll find uh, the address there, uh, the online address. Just click on it. 
but wait till Wednesday and, and you can open up access to this MOOC. It is open access, one of the things we insisted on and were able to do with the support of the New York Historical Society was to uh, make this, so Columbia and the New York Historical have funded this. It means it's free to you. So even though it'll say enroll now, go ahead and enroll. It won't cost you anything and you can look at whatever bits you want to look at when you want to look at them. Uh, the second thing that uh, uh, in the MOOC are all kinds of links to archival sources, including to many sources at the New York Historical, where we did a lot of filming, a link to some of the artifacts that women's historians have identified and used, and bibliography and exercises and so on that you can do if you feel like doing. So I'm here to say, just do it. <laughs> but I want to say one more thing before I sit down, uh, which is to say the following. Um, I have, the MOOC isn't quite finished yet. What's going online is only the first half of it. The second half will be launched at the Berkshire Conference of Women's uh, historians in June, uh, but none of this would have been possible without the New York Historical Society. So I, I want to say a very special thank you first to Louise Mirror. Uh, she and I and Peter Kaufman uh, sat at lunch one day and I said to uh, uh, Louise, what would you think about this? And Louise immediately plunged in and offered full support. And then, of course, the Center for Women's Scholarship was the perfect place to house it, and Valerie has been perfectly and wonderfully, um, not just cooperative, but collaborative. How's that for a... So, so I, I want to say that this is an example of one of the things that can happen when a major institution like Columbia gets just enough help from another major institution like the New York Historical Society, and suddenly all those barriers to doing women's history suddenly crumble and fall. So thank you for the collaboration. <laughs> I came to women's history when the women's movement illuminated an absence in my own work. I'd been working on the Jewish labor movement in New York in the 1890s, and along with all my colleagues, I could not imagine that women had been present. Indeed, the labor movement seemed to conjure up an exclusion of women. It was all male. So I wrote a dissertation that systematically excluded even the women I accidentally came across. When I realized that this had happened, and it wasn't until the women's movement drew it to my attention, I went back to the archives and searched for the women I had forgotten. And I found them, creating not for the first time, but for the first modern moment, a history of women in the labor movement of women who were poor, who were immigrant, who were activist, in rebellion, a history of women we could be proud of. We came to women's history in the late 1960s and the early 70s because we were part of a feminist political movement and a cultural movement. Um, this was a period when, as you know, women were not hired in universities. We felt that we were a phalanx moving to change the world and as part of that, we wanted to know about ourselves. Like many people, um, I went out, that was a year when you could go out and meet 
Betty Friedan, Kate Millett, Phyllis Chesler, uh, T. Grace Atkinson in one week <laughs> in New York. And um, I went to almost all of these people and said, what's this all about? And by the time I had finished interviewing all these people, I was one. In 1968, uh, when I was in Boston, um, all of a sudden there was a women's movement. And um, I was first taken by it and began to think about it, but then it dawned on me, um, there must be a history to this. No one had ever taught me this. I started doing women's history when my daughter, Hannah, was born. Uh, reading children's books that were all about boys and animals that were male. And suddenly I thought, this is what the history she would get in school will be. All about men, generals, presidents, famous inventors who are all male. And I thought, that, that can't be right, that that's all there is to American experience. I was drawn to women's history because of our lives and the lives of our friends. I mean, here we were, women in the world, um, being treated by this history of men, usually boring men, men in lies, men, you know, history of slavery, saying Sambo and Sally were happy on the old plantation, and we knew we needed another history. Well, I think everybody deserves a history. Everybody needs to know where they came from, where their roots are. Um, as an African-American woman, I was first interested in African-Americans. Uh, when I looked at African-American history, I didn't see myself represented. I didn't see the history of African-American women. Um, I felt uh, just, just drawn to that subject very naturally because I wanted to know more about who I was. I became interested in women's history because I began as a student of the history of the Civil Rights Movement. And the women I interviewed, the people I spoke to, uh, and the history I was studying made it clear that not only had women played a large role in this movement, but that their experiences were colored not just by racism, by the challenges of class in American society, but by sexism, by gendered expectations. And in order to understand their struggles and the struggles I was trying to understand, I had to begin to think critically about the history of women. It was really because of the women's movement, which hit when I was a graduate student and I became interested in pursuing the history of women, as many activists did become interested. And that was concretized for me when I had an opportunity to teach while still a graduate student. When I entered graduate school in the late 1960s, the women's movement was really beginning to take off in major ways. And we were all really swept up in the in the movement and what it offered and the potential that was ahead. It was a very exciting and, and very thrilling time to be entering the field of history. I got into women's history through women's writing. Um, my graduate work was in the English department at Columbia and you could get a PhD in English literature and never read a woman. So I noted an absence where are the women? <laughs> and I'd been doing that for maybe 30 years, working on absences, who got left out, and trying to understand who writes the record, you know, what we call the historical record, what's in it, what's missing. Traditionally, the kind of ways that people have um, thought of competing voices or dominant voices um, have served, have been a disservice to including the voices of women. So, you know, the a kind of phrase that we like to use is that we're not giving voice to the voiceless because these people have had voices, but we are is giving ears to the earless. I came to women's history um, mainly initially through the archives. Um, I was studying the plantation cells, and my interest was in labor history, in plantation labor, and in what happens with labor questions at emancipation. And there they were, the women. And then I, I didn't quite know what to do with it, but luckily for me, I came along at a moment 
when there were women historians and a few men uh, who have begun to do this amazing groundbreaking work. There is a world of documents that nobody had read and it's still true. It's still true. And what historians want are documents that no one had looked at, no one had assessed, and no one had learned from. And I've never run out of questions and documents to learn from. Basically, when I was growing up, I loved to read. And in, from third to fifth grade, I read my way through all of the biographies of women in the school library. And I just became completely intrigued by all of these women's lives. And they were things like Martha Washington, Amelia Earhart, Helen Keller, I was completely intrigued by. So I was really interested in all of these individual life stories. But then when I got into history class, it was like there was no intersection. There were no women really in history as I was learning it then. And even as I went on with my education in college and even graduate school, the women were often missing. And I just felt like if we're missing half of the population, how can we have the full story? I've always been interested in women's history since I was young, 10, 11, and I have a really vivid memory of going to the FDR Presidential Library and being so much more interested in Eleanor Roosevelt's story and realizing that that wasn't a side story that was central to the understanding of F the FDR presidency in our country at the time. So I think my entry point into it was through a woman role model. I became interested in women's history when, as a child, I would go to historic sites and houses and living history museums with my family. And I was always interested, especially in the spaces where women worked, like the kitchens or a garden, where it seemed like women were real. There was a connection to the past and to real people that resonated with me. I came from a household um, that was dominated by women. I had a strong mother, I had a very strong grandmother, um, I went to school and had strong teachers, so I lived in a world that was very much shaped by women. And when I started to study history in college, I realized not only was it you know, lacking women figures, but the topics that were um, discussed in these classes and in these books didn't um, kind of satisfy my curiosity to kind of find out more about um, the women who had shaped my world and had been shaping many other worlds as well. I'm identified by others as a historian of women and gender history, uh, but I identify as a historian of the United States because I think that the history of women in this country is the history of the United States. It offers us a different way to think about core issues of citizenship, of labor organizing, of inequality of poverty. Thank you. Again, the MOOC is free and open to all on the edX platform and is launching this Wednesday. Uh, I'd like to invite the next panel up to uh, the stage. What is the panel? The next panel. <laughs> edX. edX is a uh, platform. It's a uh, the platform that most MOOCs are are, uh, are created on. I believe, according to Al Alice, where are you? Right here. How do you want us to sit? There is uh, this brochure, which is or this flyer, which is outside, and you can pick it up is on your way out. Is this a reverse over here? Chocolate <laughs> <laughs> no. in the middle. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Having enjoyed a lively and informative series of discussions about the history of reproduction, let us now turn our attention to its future. See, the next panel is already quite lively. Uh, and if you uh, wouldn't mind, please silence your cell phones or anything that makes noise.
In our third and last panel, we ask, who gets to make a family and how? What are the ethical, legal, and scientific consequences of the different ways to have children from in vitro fertilization to surrogacy, adoption, and beyond? I'm pleased to introduce our afternoon panelists. Michelle Bratcher Goodwin is a Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine, with appointments in several departments, including the School of Law and the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies. She is the founder and director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy at UC Irvine and its internationally acclaimed Reproductive Justice Initiative. Her publications include five books and over 70 articles and book chapters on laws regulation of the human body, including civil and criminal regulation of pregnancy and reproduction, reproductive technologies, and human trafficking, among other topics. She's been a featured guest on HBO's Vice, NPR, To the Contrary, Point Taken, Radio Times with Marty Ross Cohn, On Point with Tom Ashbrook, and other news venues. Her forthcoming book, Policing the Womb, is due out this year. Loretta Ross was the national coordinator of the Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective from 2005 to 2012. She has appeared on CNN, BET, Lead Story, Good Morning America, Donahue, the National Geographic Channel, and Charlie Rose. She's been featured in the New York Times, Time Magazine, the LA Times, and the Washington Post, among others. She helped create the theory of reproductive justice in 1994 and led a rape crisis center in the 1970s. She's co-author of Undivided Rights, Women of Color Organized for Reproductive Justice in 2004. Her newest book, Reproductive Justice, an Introduction, co-written with <laughs> Ricky Solinger, is coming out this month. We had a we had a model before. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky Sollinger is a historian and a curator. She's the author or editor of 11 books about reproductive politics and satellite subjects, including Wake Up Little Susie, Single Pregnancy and Race Before Roe v. Wade, Pregnancy and Power, A Short History of Reproductive Politics in America, and Beggars and Choosers, How the Politics of Choice Shapes Adoption, Abortion, and Welfare in the United States. Solinger is the senior editor of a new book series, Reproductive Justice, A New Vision for the 21st Century, at the University of California Press. Her exhibitions have traveled to over 150 college and university galleries, including Interrupted Life, Incarcerated Mothers in the United States, which opened inside a California woman's prison. Our moderator today is Andrea Tone. Dr. Tone holds the Canada Research Chair in the Social History of Medicine at McGill University, where she has joint appointments in the faculties of medicine and the arts. Her scholarship studies the histories of women and health, sexuality, and psychiatry, particularly the intersection of patient experience and formal mechanisms and institutions of power. Her five books include Devices and Desires, A History of Contraceptives in America, which was named one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, and which inspired the Emmy Award-winning PBS American Experience documentary, The Pill. She's presently working on two book-length projects, A History of the CIA and Cold War Psychiatry, and a co-edited antholo co anthology on masculinity and medicine in modern America. Her work has been featured on ABC News, CBC, PBS, The History Channel, The New York Times, and NPR. In 2011, she received the American Psychiatric Association's Benjamin Rush Award for her contributions to the history of psychiatry. Please join me in welcoming Andrea, Michelle, Loretta, and Ricky. Okay, I have the tremendous privilege this afternoon to be able to share this stage with a cluster of scholars and activists and so much more as you just heard from Valerie's introduction. Um, and to be honest, each of these wonderful people could clearly captivate this audience for a good hour and a half. Um, at least, at, at dinner last night, I asked Loretta if she had been properly interviewed by an oral historian, and the answer was yes, and that it had taken over 30 hours. So, <laughs> so I feel like we're getting appetizers here, but that this appetizer perhaps will lead us to... Um, to more things, longer discussions, uh, 30 hours of viewing time for an oral history. 
I see my role as moderator this afternoon as being largely marginal, but I did want to start by just elaborating a little bit on the importance of looking at this issue through a comparative framework. So if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I'd like to start with that, and then I would like to let um, these leading ladies claim the stage. I was a professor in Atlanta in 2000 when I um, had a planned pregnancy. And I remember being a little bit overwhelmed. It was my uh, first child, but also being really relieved to learn that she was going to be born in November because in the year 2000, working at a publicly funded university in the state of Georgia meant that there was no such thing as a paid maternity leave. So being born in November meant that I could stitch together five years of banked up sick leave and the time that was allocated by the university for Thanksgiving break and the December break, and I didn't have to be back in the classroom until January, and that seemed really luxurious. Um, I ended up, unfortunately, needing an emergency C-section, which I fought um, quite heroically but unsuccessfully because I'd read books such as Her Bodies Ourselves, and I knew that C-sections, I'm just gonna do another pitch for this, although I don't get any kickback for doing so. I just think it's such an important book. Um, at, at least for my, my generation. And the problem with an emergency C-section is that there hadn't, at least in my childbirth classes, been a lot of attention paid to what that might mean, what that's gonna entail. And I, I became really thrown off my game when I learned that because um, cars at this point in time, uh, new cars, all had airbags that inflate, that having a C-section meant that you could not drive for eight weeks because if you got into a car crash and your airbag inflates, your uterus could be ruptured. And I was living in a place in Atlanta where you just really couldn't walk to things. So suddenly it's just you know, layer upon layer of, of problems seem to exist. Um, but I did survive and I, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in that first year not, not getting enough sleep, trying to you know, prep with my daughter beside me and just wondering and admiring all the other mothers who'd come before me who didn't have the kinds of privileges I had. You know, what about people who weren't able to take advantage of Clinton's Family and Medical Leave Act in 1992? What about people who've been born before the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, which, you know, with both of these things, uh, Clinton's Family and Medical Leave Act, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, they're, they're great laws in, in theory, but as Michelle and I were discussing over lunch, th these policies work only to the extent that they are enforced. And if you are a woman who does not have the means to have a lawyer, you're war and there has been, I believe, a Supreme Court case about this, you're a woman wa working in Walmart, you're having problems with your pregnancy, and uh, Walmart fires you, those protections in place are only useful if you are able to hire a lawyer who will advocate on your behalf. So I mean, it's, another, it's another issue, another problem. But if I fast forward to today, as Valerie said, I now live in Quebec. And I think especially coming from the United States is a little bit of a culture shock um, in a, and a political shock in a very good way. And I want to um, just say that <laughs> <laughs> I've lived in Montreal now for over a decade, and like any city, it has lots of problems. The province of Quebec has lots of problems. I'm not trying to, you know, stump for Canada. Um, uh, well, I am a little bit, but I, but I do want to say that's remarkable that only one hour away from where we are all sitting today, there exists this political experiment that's only been a few decades in the making that has resulted in some really quite remarkable results. So in Quebec, there is paid maternity and paternity leave. And that leave is not tethered to the means by which you become a parent. So it does not matter if you have adopted a child who is seven. It does not matter if you have um, 
use surrogacy, you've given birth yourself, all of that really matters is that you are now a parent and there are all sorts of um, policies and inf infrastructure in place to support that. You don't have to worry if you have an emergency C-section about driving to get your child checked out at the six week mark or you checked out at the same time because they have a visiting nurse program that comes to your home and that weighs your child and does the inoculations. And these nurses have fairly broad discretionary powers. So a very close friend of mine who had her second baby and who's done an oral history, so I'm not like divulging any private secrets, um, recalled after having her second daughter uh, that she felt extremely overwhelmed and distraught and she had sort of self-diagnosed herself as having postpartum depression. And she was talking this, about this to the nurse and the nurse said, well, what do you, what's the thing that bothers you the most? And she said, I, I just feel like my whole house now is in a state of chaos and disarray. And so for those of you have, who have read Laura Thatcher Ulrich's book, A Midwife's Tale, there's a really wonderful chapter in that book, sort of talks about how women, in this case the midwife herself, can just feel like the household, the appliances in the kitchen are all at odds against you. Um, and so what was really neat though is that what the nurse did is said, well, do you want to hold off on talking more about the possibility of postpartum depression? Why don't I bring you in instead a cleaning service? And the nurse said, I mean, my friend said, Are, really? Like there's a cleaning service I do not have to pay for that's so somehow affiliated with healthcare here? And she's like, yes. And so she had her house cleaned, her apartment cleaned for like two times a week for a couple months until she felt better. So I'm not saying postpartum depression does not exist. I'm not going to do a Tom Cruise <laughs> moment here or say that postpartum drugs shouldn't be prescribed. But in this case, it did exactly what it needed to do. Uh, we also have $7 a day daycares with low caregiver to children ratios. Um, and what I think is because I probably could speak much more about this, and I, I do want them to have the stage that they've earned. What, what I think is really fascinating about this system, about this um, political experiment, is that while it has a lot of problems, like it's really hard to get a place in that $7 a day daycare. If you want to have an elective C-section, there is no protocol for that. You're gonna to have to pay for it um, out of pocket yourself, which some might see as a very good thing. Um, but people resent that they have to pay taxes. Quebec is the highest tax province in Canada. But no one I've ever met has said, yep, those $7 a day daycares, they're a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Having men have the right to have uh, paternity leave, ugh, terrible. So there's some resentment about you know, the taxes we pay. But in just a generation, the idea that we can support parenting, we can support pregnancy, we can support sort of the totality of women's health experiences, um, and the needs of children has, has come about to great success. And we have four years of a publicly funded IVF program, acknowledging that IVF is really expensive and it exists in Quebec. And so if we don't have it, it will become um, a means to get pregnant. That's really the privilege of very rich people. It only lasted for four years because it was too expensive for the public purse in a, in a public health care economy. Um, but I will simply end then by saying that I think that we hear a lot in the United States, oh, well, that's Canada. Or just for the record, there's no real Canadian healthcare system. It's divided by province. So we can say, oh, well, that's Quebec. Um, yeah, and it's still in our way. It's another country away. But the interesting thing is that a decade ago, people in Quebec were, had those same sort of questions and issues. And I like to think, therefore, that this kind of comparative approach reminds us that there are other choices that have been made by other people in the past that this dialogue that we're having today can be a first step towards something sort of more wonderful and better and that we really shouldn't stop having that conversation no matter how complicated it is. So to continue this conversation, um, I would like to turn the floor over to all of my wonderful 
panelists. And <clears throat> as, as I said to all of them, I'm very happy to uh, now be quiet largely and uh, be at the sign lines and to really try to just generate a very, very lively, dynamic discussion where as long as you're not throwing people to the ground, um, you know, oh, interrupting <laughs> and, you know, asking for clarifications. She didn't say there'd be rules. <laughs> is perfectly fine with me uh, up to a point. Um, but I wanted to sort of begin, especially for the benefit of people who are here only for the afternoon sessions, um, to, to look at, at what this word that we've been using today, reproductive justice, means. So here we have reproductive rights. You have written a, all of you have written on uh, reproductive justice. What is the difference? Why is it important that the conversation that we carry forward use this term? And why is it considered, for some of us who may not know as well as you, why does it have this kind of like that? political freight that doesn't make it as sort of routine to use in conversations. We can defer to you, darling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to hold up the book. Get the book. There you go. Uh, <laughs> no, but all jokes aside, Ricky and I wrote a primer to introduce people to the concept of reproductive justice. It's a teachable book, so from now on, I'm going to say get the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but Reproductive Justice, a group of 12 black women, of which I was one, in 1994, were problematizing Hillary Clinton's attempt to do health care reform. And the Democrats decided that for some reason, if they omitted any reference to reproductive health care, that they could sneak it past the Republican Congress. How well do y'all think that worked out? And so, we thought that it was really not going to happen that they could faint to the right and then move back to the left and include the needs of women. And so we looked at that situation. Not only did it suck as a strategy, but it really turns out this is what happens when men conceptualize health care, when they don't acknowledge that reproductive health care is the main reason women go to the doctors. And so we also didn't like the fact that abortion was isolated from reproductive health care, which doesn't serve us well or the movement very well. And so we wanted to re-embed abortion. We wanted to talk about reproductive health care as social justice issues. And so we spliced together the concept of reproductive rights and social justice and created the term reproductive justice. And we did it by centering African-American women in the lens uh, because that's, that's what we needed from healthcare reform. Now, since then, a lot of people have mythologized that we created it to challenge the pro-choice framework, which is really a kind of racist way of looking at it because that would have meant that white women were in the center of our lens and not ourselves. Uh, it did challenge the pro-choice framework, but that was incidental. That was not why it was created. That was just the consequence of it being created. That it did say we've got to move beyond privacy and individualism and all of that. And the fact that we centered it in the human rights framework uh, based on our experience seeing how the global women's movement successfully used the human rights framework meant that we shifted it away from the constitutional limitations and the preoccupation with the Supreme Court, um, which worked for us. But it does destabilize traditional pro-choice, pro-life binaries that you know, uh, preoccupy the movement. So let me shut up quickly, but let's say, what is reproductive justice? Uh, we joined with the pro-choice movement in right, fighting for the right not to have kids. So we support abortion and birth control and abstinence, if you go that way. Um, but we come from communities of color that suffer from extreme population control. So we have to fight equally as hard for the right to have our children and the, the conditions under which we want to have children. You know, to resist forced cesareans or denial of cesareans or, you know, not 
complying with your own birth plan and the right to use midwives and all of those things that are about the right to have birth. And the whole birth justice movement has spawned out of just that second tenet. And then thirdly, the third tenet is the right to raise our children in safe and healthy environments which brings us into conversation with the Black Lives Matter movement, police. environmental justice, police violence, Indian, Native American sovereignty, uh, sex and sexuality, gender identity. I mean, all of those kinds of things. And so, as Ricky has often pointed out to me, reproductive justice is everything. It's all in there. And <laughs> I, actually, I want to I want to bring Trump front and center, who has not actually <laughs> been um, too much, his name right. has not been on everyone's lips Frank, today. Like Baltimore more, you know, he who <laughs> shall not Baltimore. be named, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think looking at the Trump administration's agenda gives us a good idea of what reproductive justice is, what it requires to be a vibrant and um, organizing tool and also agenda for women's dignity and safety, for, all, for the dignity and safety of communities all over the country. Um, you know, this, the, this administration is trying to slash and destabilize health care. Well, of course, in order to have children, you need to have access to health care. It's aiming to slash and destabilize education in the United States, likewise, needed to be able, what, what, what would a woman or a person think when they decide whether or not to get pregnant and whether or not to stay pregnant? Will my child have a decent and safe education? Access to health care. What kind of environment will my child live within? Policing and incarceration, two high priorities of the Trump administration to bolster police brutality and to um, go back to private prisons and in no way to deal with prisons otherwise. Um, and also the attempts to slash and destabilize public provision of all kind and civic engagement, such as voting. So these are, when you look at his administration's goals. And immigration. Let's and, oh, forget. it's an immigration. Thank you. Um, when, when you look at his, his um, administration's goals, you understand how reproductive justice is a call for and provides really very rich coalition building um, in the name of all of these elements which go into the possibility for safe and dignified reproduction. So what I would like to add to, th to that to, um, is that you know, the, the rights framework, I, I teach a course on women and the rule of law. And what's important to know is that um, rights can be illusory. And I'll give you an example that pulls in, again, the international context. Um, for a number of years, I've been talking about forced underage marriage as a form of human trafficking. Right? It has many of the same uh, components of it. But what you find is that globally around the world, there are countries that have, they have laws on the book and, and they've signed on to various treaties saying, oh, we don't support forced underage marriage. You know, in India, for example, in India, there are a number of rules. Over the last hundred years, they've passed half dozen laws about no underage marriage. And I've been to communities that are some of the scariest that I've ever been to in my life where overwhelmingly, we're talking about 60 to 80% of the women in those provinces have been forced into marriage it, as children, you know, we're talking about as girls that are 10, 7, 8, 9 years old. So even though it's illegal, right, so what's the point of the rule of law and rights if they're not enforced? And this is why a number of people within the human rights context say that what well, we really need to think about are human rights and not just the kind of rule of law rights. And in fact, thinking back about India, so I've visited communities and I've met young girls. I, I've met one, one young girl, 15 years old, about to be married to her second husband because the first one died. And she was being married then to his brother. She was absolutely miserable. And then you go from you know, Bihar to Delhi and meet with legislators and they say, well, no, 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 no. Look at this stack of bills and things over in the corner. We don't, you know, we did our part. 
And that's largely it, sort of thinking about we've done our part. You think about the Supreme Court, you know, and the holding on to Roe, well, we've done our part, but have we really done our part? And if you were here this morning, you heard about all of those trap laws, these targeted regulations of abortion providers. Is this sort of case of, is it more illusory than real? When it's real, you don't have to worry about it and fight about it or worry if you might be arrested, just simply in the context of just trying to take care of yourself. And the reproductive justice framework gets us back to thinking about just being able to have the same comfortable access to health care, um, whether you want to carry a pregnancy to term or whether or not you want to have an abortion. And that's one of the challenges of what's been left out over the last 30 or 40 years. And, and if I'd add just one point to that, we find ourselves in this crooked and crazy world right now, um, in part crazy, right, crazy, uh, in part because the rights movement failed to pay attention to what was happening to poor women of color 30 years ago when they were being dragged out of hospitals in bloodied gowns, shackled and chained, giving births in prison toilets and on prison floors. The rights movement said those aren't our women. You know, those women with their complicated lives and their complicated pregnancies, that's not us. Well, now it is us, right? It is, right? This is the, what happens, like Lisa Epstein in Florida a couple years ago threatened with having the police come to her house and drag her out if she didn't appear for a forced C-section, right? An email from her doctor, and you've heard about these cases across the country. The hundreds of women in Alabama Who've been, who've been forced into plea deals because uh, prosecutors have said that they were trafficking drugs to their fetuses. Or even think about in the state of Wisconsin, which during that era, right, of the crackdown on black women passed a law euphemistically called the crack baby mama law, right? And it's a law that provides that the state of Wisconsin, for any reason, can take control of the woman's body for the protection of her fetus. So now let's think about Alicia Beltran, not black, but a white woman a couple years ago who goes in for a prenatal visit and is talking up to the medical provider and saying, I'm so happy about my life right now, but I used to have an addiction to prescription meds, and boy, am I so happy it's over. Police around her house drag her into court. Attorney is provided for her fetus, none for her, and the state of Wisconsin, on no evidence of any current drug use, alcohol use, or anything, incarcerated her for over 70 days. This is called the chickens coming home to roost and the canary in the coal mine. It has now come to bite us, and if we had been thinking in more nuanced terms years ago about the whole woman and her whole identity, we wouldn't be where we are today. I want to just bring the reproductive justice thing back to history, though. Because I know that I'm not, well, first of all, I know I'm not a historian. I'm an activist, a professional hellraiser. And yeah, I should put that on my business card. Yes, yes. Have hell will bring, you know? Yes. <laughs> or something we'll like come. that. Or come, right. Uh, but I, I want to, if, if you don't mind, talk about the intersection of history and activism, because that is my when and where I enter story. Uh, and I really want to start off by appreciating the fact that it was women who historians that continuously provide me with the ammunition I need to take on these assholes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because it's not just enough to know the present. You've got to know what went on before you in order to strategize for the future. I mean, that is what we live. And so if you think that you're only writing your PhD so that you can pass a brutal committee, that's not true. I mean, maybe you do need to get through that brutal committee, but that ain't what I'm talking about. <laughs> I am talking about how we in the field have to use what you write as evidence in our testimony before committees and in ways to organize people. And so I want to tell one or two quick stories and how that's worked, if that's You have okay. to be quick. Uh, quick, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of quick, as I proved <laughs> this morning. Um, first of all, let's talk about 1986. Ellie Smill, president of NOW, 
had decided that we were going to have the first abortion rights march, and I was on her staff at the time. So Ellie comes to me and says, Loretta, I need you to organize women of color for this march. And I'm like, Ellie, they don't even say the A word. And she said, we'll help them get over it. <laughs> yeah, Ellie. And so I started going around to leading black women, Donna Brazile, Dorothy Hyde, Jewel Jackson McCabe. You've written, if you haven't written books about them, you should. That's another story. And they were uniform in saying, well, if we talk about abortion rights, we won't necessarily be reflecting the will of our constituency. Except that I was reading the statistics from the Guttmacher Institute. Black women get one third of the abortions in America. And if the leading black women aren't talking about that, who is? And so I have to pay homage to people like Linda Gordon and Ross Pajeski and Betsy Hartman. And I, Ricky, I hadn't met you then, so <laughs> I, I can't put you on this list. But uh, uh, those were people whose books I grabbed off the shelves because I just happened to know that somebody was writing about this stuff. And I took it to the, the Dorothy Heights and the data. And Dorothy had a long history, so I'm not trying to act like she didn't have history. I'm saying she did, was not convinced that black women should march in an abortion rights march. That was the point I was making. And I was able to provide evidence. And then I ran into this woman named Jessie Rodriguez and her work on black women and birth control. And next thing I knew, I was able to mobilize black women and women of color to march for the abortion rights march in 86. So that was history being used to prove it, that we were just standing on our sister's shoulders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was not something being done all over again for the first time, da, da, da. The second time I'll say it's even more recent. In 2010, these billboards appeared in Atlanta that said, uh, black children are endangered species. And I knew I had to do three things because the New York Times called me the day the billboards came out. And because, of course, the opponents hadn't let the Times know <laughs> that the billboards were coming. They didn't bother to let us know, but they let the Times know. And so I made a call to the Sophia Smith collection at Smith. And I said, I've got, I need evidence. I need evidence. And so Joyce Filet at Smith get, sent me documents because I had to do th three things. I had to shift the frame from the womb to the woman. I had to discredit my opponents. And then I had to lift up black women. And so by shifting the frame, I talked about how, why are you focused on the womb? Why not focus on black women? Secondly, uh, Ryan Baumberger, this unhappy guy who had put up these billboards, uh, and I won't even talk about him anymore except to say he's deeply troubled. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I put his reputation up against DuBose, Mary McLeod Bethune, Martin Luther King with the documents that Smith College had sent me. And so he had to then say, I know more about the black community than these icons. Do y'all think that worked? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then third, I had to lift up black women and we formed Trust Black Women to do that. And that also rested on historical evidence of what black women had done in the past. So I'll shut up, but that's how we use what you do. Yeah. What you have to do is understand to, uh, uh, and have conversations with us about what we need. <laughs> uh, because I find that a lot of history is written to satisfy some obscure point in some obscure place. I would like to come in actually know. and put Ricky in the spotlight, yeah. if that's okay. Well, I, I want to talk about history in a, in a slightly different way. And, Jim Moore reminded me um, this morning that um, historians long view, um, centuries long, and even though I have spent a lot of time hanging out in the pre-civil rights movement, pre-Griswold, pre-Roe period, I um, ha have also looked across time, and it's very clear to me that reproductive law and policy in the United States, the official stuff, has always been designed, existed to justify, institutionalize, sustain, and revitalize white supremacy 
and sexism. From the slavery regime to the man in the house rules, which surveyed the sex life of poor women, largely women of color. From Native American removal to the sterilization of Native women. Um, the invention of white adoption. Immigration law. The, if, look at the Immigration Act of 1924. Um, look at the immigration discussion today. The interest in maintaining the United States as a white country. Um, if you look at the rules that govern Chinese immigration and how women were not allowed to come. The Paint Act, exactly. And, and in the country that had anti miscegenation laws, um, so that Chinese men were proscribed from having sex with anybody. And that was because Chinese men were allowed in as laborers, but nobody wanted them as citizens. Exactly. Um, so, um, this, so when we sit here and or when I live my life beating my breast about I'm 70 years old and I'm still writing books about the same thing I was writing about when I had little children in the house, um, it's pretty depressing. But the fact is that it's actually part of a very, very long history. And um, that's the context in which I think we need to look at it. And I'm just going to say one more thing, which is that when I think about what I really took away from the years I spent looking at the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the period right before Roe, um, and as the civil rights movement was gathering form, focus, and power, um, I, I the th there are three things I want to say quickly that I really were, the mo were among the most powerful things that I took away. One was that the gravest danger that women, all women, faced in those decades was the law. Yes. And so people talk about this as if the gravest danger was the back alley butcher, which is basically a consumer protection argument. You know, if we make these, and first of all, most of people who did abortions did them day in and day out, knew what they were doing, and did many, many. Um, of course, if you make something illegal, which is crucial to women's existence, they will sometimes go to beauty parlor operators. Right. Um, but the fact is that um, uh, the law said to all women, your body is in bondage. We know about enslavement in the United States. Enslavement means that you have no sovereignty over your body. And these laws which governed women's bodies said you are basically enslaved to your reproduction. Um, and uh, every woman, whether she ever climbed up on the abortionist table or not, um, knew um, that the law endangered her and degraded her. It endangered her by degrading her. Uh, of course, different groups of women were endangered differently. And that's my second point, that when the state takes the right to decide these laws and policies that govern women's body, it also takes the right to treat different groups of women differently. And that's what we saw in the past. It's what we see in the present. And if we are not... Um, organizing in a massive way under a reproductive justice framework, we will see it in the future. We will continue to see it. Um, and these ways of treating different groups of women differently um, showed us that there was never a universal experience of fertility, sex, fertility, and reproduction, so that concepts like family planning or birth control even, were never really sufficient and, in fact, laid the groundwork for the thinness and insufficiency of choice, yeah. which is, you know, right. obviously a failed concept. And finally, the last thing I want to say is that the abortion trial transcripts that I collected and still have in my basement, thousands of pages of abortion trials, which I read in order to find out what was at issue in the courtroom? What were these people upset about? Why did they, after World War II, start to arrest lots of practitioners even when there was no murder? And um, there's a lot to say about that, but I'll just say one thing, which is that 
like Jim Moore said this morning, the fetus was not an actor in the, um, not a presence, not an entity most of the time in the courtroom. When the crime was described, well, I have to just tell you that the table, sometimes the abortion table was wheeled in. The woman was asked to describe how her body was arrayed on the table, how far apart her legs were spread, which instruments were put into which of her orifices. Oh, I was going to have a slide up there, but sorry. Um, and um, ah, yeah, just just eat that <laughs> for lunch. Yeah. Um, uh, so there was um, a lot of degradation in the courtroom, a lot of what I call crypto pornography going on in the courtroom. But the last point here is that the woman's crime jumps off of the pages of these trial transcripts as being murdering motherhood. That is the only proper destiny for a woman, which makes really clear the gendered nature of her crime, the gendered nature, nature of her um, bad doing. And in fact, um, that's what we see in the period before Roe and today. Mm. I wanted to ask, um, and thank you for that, and thank you for this fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, startling. I just included uh. this because it's, um, it's such a blatant and disturbing and ugly representation of the vulnerability of all women who read the morning paper. I wanted to ask a, a two-part question to Michelle, but also to all of you, and that is you know, mu much of the conversation today has been about how women have a right, sometimes restricted, to exercise fertility control, whether that means access to birth control or access to abortion, and that's very important. Do you think that women have the right to become parents? Um, that's the broader question, but uh, to you specifically, Michelle, you've said in the past that uh, pregnant women are equal citizens, but citizens who have less authority and autonomy to control what happens to their bodies than anyone else. And I wonder if you could sort of elaborate on that sure. point. Sure. Well, you know, it's so wonderful that we're having this discussion today uh, in this space, and so I want to thank everyone here um, from the Historical Society and to commend and applaud them for that. It's really so important. And in fact, I'd love to take a moment to just mm -hmm. thank them because that's really important. And I'm sorry that I didn't earlier. So, I mean, this has historically been true. It's been rooted in the very fabric of our country and we tend to be very ahistorical. Uh, our memories are just a glimpse and then we're off to something else. And the very foundation of our country was about controlling women and women's reproduction. Um, during the antebellum period, it was about forcing labor upon, and in every kind of way of thinking about that, onto black women. Um, it was also a time of coverture. We borrowed coverture laws uh, from the European systems, from the French, then to the English, and then into the United States. And we didn't have to do that. I mean, you think about it, the United States prides itself on its great new constitution, the way that it thought about a Bill of Rights, all of that. But it decided to keep the same creepy ways of thinking about women. For example, uh, marital rape. Marital rape was legal in this country until the 1990s. Why? Borrowed from European law. You know, Blackstone's one of the most quoted scholars in all of Supreme Court cases. And what did Blackstone write about? There's no, there's impossibility of a man ever raping his wife because she is one with her husband and the husband can't rape himself, right? This is, so it's so just baked in, built into both the lives of black women when they came to this country um, as forced laborers, as slaves, and then also uh, within the space of white women as well. And then it's been, put upon every other, and, and, and let's just say also with acknowledging Native women, right? Native women who were taken out of their homes, who were decimated and killed off, and then forced to be on reservations. But I think there's also a very important story to tell about um, midwifery and the next layer of some form of emancipation. 
um, nearly 100% of all kind of reproductive health care was controlled by women in the United States uh, prior to the abolition of slavery. Right after the abolition of slavery, you get male doctors who want to get involved in that space, and they feel very insecure. Horatio Storer, Joseph D. Lee, they write these pamphlets about how we have to get rid of midwives, and then they villainize midwives, women who had had control and doing this all along, right? I actually think it was a form of monopolizing women's oh. bodies, right, economically, yeah. right? Yes. Because now, you know, slavery is over, whatnot, they'd have to compete with these black women who had been doing this work all along. But what better way than to shut them down and use the tools of abortion in that way? Suddenly a love affair with the fetus that had never been before, um, but was a very creative way to push women out of those reproductive uh, spaces. And, and history has not changed much since then. I share Ricky's frustration. I really, really do. I mean, when you look at where we are today, the fact that both what we might want to shut those doors when you think about where we are today with the helms amendment we talked a little bit about hyde earlier today but if you think about the helms amendment the way the ways in which the united states um, exports a very dangerous foreign policy that says if you get foreign aid from us, it can't be used in any kind of way associated with abortion, information about abortion, family planning connected to that, and then what's called the global gag rule, right, to this Mexico City policy that was put into place by Reagan and then in every Republican administration has been signed on through executive order again, which says that if you get money from the United States, right, to, to an NGO, um, you can't use even another source's funding for use in reproductive health care, such as about abor abortion, information, et cetera. And in the abstract, this may mean nothing to Americans, right? And they're like, oh, so what? Who, you know, sort of like our tax dollars, what we give, so what? We care about this machismo. But you think about it, it sets up this two-tiered world. Women in the United States get these things and can use these things and opportunities. But yet, yeah, we're enforcing a different kind of personhood on women elsewhere. And it means something when you think about these cases of girls who've been raped and are 11 years old and pregnant. You think about when you hear the rhetoric of the president in that country or the health minister in that country saying, she's not gonna get an abortion, no abortion. And then think about the United States. That is not a decision that is purely within that country and certainly not for that girl. These are decisions that are influenced by the people who control our government. And we have to be concerned about those issues, not just at home, but also what happens abroad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm preoccupied, as Ricky alluded to, to this re I don't even want to call it a resurgence of neo-fascism. <laughs> I often think that that's a privileged mm. position that those of us who haven't been affected by white supremacy directly now recognize. But Dr. Willie Parker says wonderfully, at times like these, it's always been times like these. <laughs> you know, welcome to waking up. Um, and so I want to, I'm more preoccupied with what to do when your very existence has always been an existential threat to white supremacy. You know, there was, there was, there was no halcyon period where black people were not threatened by white supremacy. So I would like to invite people to pay attention and uh, I, I certainly invite all the people who were surprised by the election to notice that 94% of black women without college degrees knew Trump for an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be clear, who, who got the memo and who didn't? Yeah. Uh, so, but what we're talking about now, though, is that with the work of the scholarship of Ricky and Linda and Ellen and all the people, Andrea, all of y'all people, Michelle, if we don't know how to rationalize, racialize an abortion analysis now, I don't know when we're going to. Because I heard people talk about 
the abortion rates plummeting, which is true, but notice where they're rising. In ill-educated, poor white communities who voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, where teen, not, not the abortion rates, I'm sorry, the teen pregnancy rates are rising. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the one population that's having out of control births are the most religious, are the least educated, and are the most white. And so if you don't understand how to take a racial analysis of abortion politics now, you really don't know what's going on mm -hmm. in terms of what's going on in this country and how The Handmaid's Tale is a blueprint, not a fantasy. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we need to pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, just like Michelle talked about, you know, I wanted to just say something about rights, though, because a lot of people uh, dispute the foundation of the human rights framework that we promote, largely for good legitimate reasons. The states, the, the whole nation state system is suspect. Uh, the lack of US compliance and enforcement uh, is suspect and all of that. But I want to argue that those of you preoccupied with the law missed one important memo that we black people have learned, and that is the law has only ever been as good as we made it be. You know, we don't just simply say you pass a law and then that's taken care of it. Because most of the laws we used to fight segregation were passed immediately after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. There weren't new laws. There was failure for 90 years to enforce the laws that were already on the books. And, and one <laughs> add on to that, yeah. did you, did you, I want to think about <coughs> lynching. And, and the, the one slide that I would have shown is the, the slide of a photo of Laura Nelson, a black woman, uh, hanging from a bridge um, after being lynched and her son right beside her, who's a teenager. Uh, the reason is that supposedly her, her husband stole a cow, right? So they came after her and her son and they, they lynched them. And what's so fascinating is that um, you saw so many lynchings in this country and even picnics surrounding the lynchings, right? Most of those images depict men, but there were lots of black women who were also lynched and black little girls who were lynched uh, in this country. But interestingly enough, um, it was actually illegal. But, but you, you think about right, how these happen, right? That, that law didn't matter. You could go right into the jail, take the person out, and hang them right in front of the courthouse. Right? So it gives us a sense. I mean, I think rights do matter. Rights are incredibly important. But without enforcement, without a care to enforce, where do they go? I mean, one moment here is to think about the difference between the death of Michael Brown before the use of a cell phone. We'll pretend this is a cell phone. And after. When Michael Brown died, our nation was really divided. There are lots of folks in our country. Um, who, white people in our country who said he must have done something to the officer. Why else would an, would an officer just shoot him that many times? He must have beaten him up. I mean, he must have done something extraordinary. Well, meanwhile, black folks were saying, look, we've been saying for decades that centuries. these are the kind centuries, hello, that these are the kinds of things that happen, that they happen, they happen. Now, Folks got the memo, use the cell phone, and what do we see? So many that it overwhelms people, where people don't want to see anymore, where they don't want to see how quickly Tamir Rice was shot and murdered. How quickly? When I saw that video, I kept thinking, is this fast forward? Because in 30 seconds to come across a child and shoot him dead in a park, in a country that's fascinated with guns, that loves guns so much, and to shoot down this child who's holding a plastic one, right? So it takes more than just law, and sometimes it takes something like a cell phone, actually, to make lives matter. I want to digress a little bit yes. more. You were talking about how lynchings happen. Um, I, Something that very impressed me about the New York Historical Society was that it had the moral courage to show the Without Sanctuary exhibit years ago when the yes. Atlanta History Center passed on it yes. because it was too concerned about the political and financial yes. blowback. And I remember yes. coming here, seeing those incredible postcards celebrating lynching. And anyway, so I just want to give a good shout out to the New York Historical Society.
to look at that exhibit. Yes. So it was powerful on all levels. Yes. Yeah. It was yes. fantastic. Um, I, so I want to um, circle back to uh, a theme that seems to be hovering over us all. We, we talk a lot about um, abortion and uh, birth control activism. And it seems that this last panel in some ways is sort of like pushing us to ask what can happen in the future, but also uh, demanding that we look at um, reproductive health in a more sort of holistic or encompassing way. How do we move beyond that kind of single issue activism to advocate for um, broader terms such as reproductive justice when so many people out there may not know what it is? Do we march in the streets to make sure that the laws that you know, you've written about that scrutinize the pregnant woman um, are, are re-examined if so many people out there don't even know that these laws exist? So what is the path forward for activists and, and what are we advocating for? I'm one of those people that thinks that we have to be strategically sophisticated. We can't say we're going to use the tactics of the civil rights movement from the 1960s and the 21st century. So it's not just marching, but who marches? Who has the privilege to get arrested now and who doesn't? Yeah. It's not just protests. Who can afford to have legal cover and who doesn't? You know, when we insist that the most vulnerable people bear the weight for the rest of us, we're resting on our damn privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and we've just got to grow up. Yes. And, 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 and stop whining about being white and privileged and use it yes. in a particular strategic way. This yes. is what we're, what we're at right now. Um, and, and, and I don't think anybody has the luxury of thinking that they're not going to come for you. Trump has exposed yeah. that, yeah. if nothing else. And he's not even smart enough to figure it all out. <laughs> this was the fix before he came. Yes, that's right. He's the that's outcome. Right. He's that's not right. the progenitor of this stuff, that's of, right. of, of this white Don't forget Supreme. Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms really? played an incredible part in the moment we're living out today. Oh, absolutely. And members of Congress allowed that to happen. And I think it's also important to remember that we have to hold everyone to account. People think about the Helms Amendment, International Hyde Amendment. Who thinks about the Biden Amendment? There's a oh, Biden really? Amendment as well that, oh, yes. Oh, that's but Biden just, gave us exactly. Clarence Thomas. And well, well hello there, him. too. But the, the <laughs> Biden Amendment um, is, is, is virtually a Helms Amendment, right? I mean, it adds on in terms of medical training. A lot of folks didn't know that. I mean, the Violence Against Women's Act uh, is absolutely wonderful what Biden championed. And, and that was great that, was that he atonement. got to <laughs> Well, in a lot of ways it was, because if you look at his history with the Biden Amendment, and, and there are so many others, I mean, look, let's be clear that the United States ranks behind countries that we call human rights abusers in terms of the elevation of women to elected office. In the entire history of our, of our Congress and the Senate, we've had 35 women elected, 20 serving now, right? That's shameful. It's absolutely shameful. We have to fill this pipeline. That too frustrates me. If you, if you look at political representation of women, it's very slight. I've been involved in a research project that's looking at the health and other outcomes of women in states all across this country. And where it's the worst in terms of teen pregnancy, uh, where it's uh, the worst in terms of maternal morbidity and infant mortality, happens to be in states where there's very low representation of women in elected office. We're talking about states where the women make up 50, 50, 50 51, 52% of the population and are 5% of the state legislature. Well, you can expect high rates of teen pregnancy in a lot of those states. Um, uh, sex education is off the books, or if it's on, it's abstinence-only education. You see horrible outcomes in states where women have virtually no political representation. And we've got to put a change to that. We've, we've got to stop that. Um, that's an incredibly important. And I think with but, that. But would you speak to working outside the legal system, too? Because we're dealing with legal and extra legal processes you that are we need absolutely, to confront. And you are absolutely right. We just can't right. say we're going to stay within the law and make any kind of change. I'm sorry. I don't see 
that as an yeah. option when the yeah. law is our terrorist. Mm. Well, you know, you're absolutely, well, that, that there's such a sad truism that is about that, um, that we've not spent real time unpacking, but that has been the terror for a number of women. I served on a board of uh, directors of an organization called Gina's Team, and I was introduced to the organization by a woman named Sue Ellen Allen who went into prison with breast cancer. And she tells this horrible story about being shackled and chained while going to get what she said her breast chopped off. So nobody bothers to think about women's lives in prison. Breast cancer, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, all of that. But the organization's called Gina's team because her 25-year-old cellmate died, went lapsed into a coma and then died three days after she was finally provided medical care. Along the way, all of the women, and this is weeks and weeks of complaining, feverish, all of that, women who had been complaining for her to get medical care were threatened with solitary confinement. This is Arizona. It's important that everybody in this audience know in Arizona, solitary confinement can mean being put in the yard. There are women who have literally fried to death in Arizona in the middle of the yard. And as you say, who can afford to do the certain kinds of protesting? That's an important piece as well because the United States has a fascination with mass incarceration. We, and, and that too, we treat as a sex kind of dynamic because we talk about, well, we gotta save black and Latino men. And that's right, because we're off the chart, literally, in terms of how we incarcerate them. But guess what? The US incarcerates more women than any other country in the world, more than Russia, China, India, Thailand combined, and toss in Mexico too. Did you know that? Between 77 and 2007, the rate of incarceration of women has been more than 800% in this country. Right? Those things are part of the story. That's also a part of the extra legal story. The last point that I'll make to that in terms of what we need to know, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but it did not abolish slavery in prison. It left an, an exception where you could enslave people in US prisons. It is not a surprise then how we incarcerate people. It is not a surprise then the rate of openings of private prisons and then when you think about the global economy, it's not just that the U.S. is shipping jobs elsewhere, the U.S. is shipping work to prisons. So what should the reproductive rights movement do, Ricky? Yes. <laughs> Answer that, Ricky. Now all eyes on Ricky, yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm gonna invoke Linda Gordon who said the historians don't do that. Um, uh, but. I think it's really clear, then I'll say one sentence about it, it's really clear that coalition politics is, has got to happen. And I think when you talk about extra legal, you might clarify that in part you're talking about what needs to be focused on besides changing the laws or even seeing that laws are enforced. We're talking about communities. Well, I'm not necessarily yes. talking about armed resistance. Yes, yeah, that's right. I want yeah. to, to be clear about, about that. that. <laughs> to be clear. But, but yes. I am talking about how can we prioritize getting women the abortion pill, whether or not it's legal or not? Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that we have accurate evidence-based sex education taking place among young people, whether or not the school system okays it or not? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what can we do to center women's lives and do whatever it takes to help women save their life? Do we need a couple of hundred thousand Jane Collectives restarted nowadays? Should we be preparing for that right now? Because if they recriminalize abortion, women are going to die. And at that point, it will be our fault. So then because we have the knowledge to yeah. become thousands of abortion providers. We know that now. We're not like the women in Chicago who, did, who had to find a doctor to teach them. We know this now. The question is, are we too safe and too comfortable and too circumscribed in our reaction to fascism? to be able to actually form an effective resistance movement. So could we then talk about accountability too? Because I think that that gets left off the table as well. What do we owe to ourselves, our daughters, our nieces, and others, right, and our own accountability? One of the topics that we haven't talked about is thinking about IVF and surrogacy. Mm -hmm. Right now, as people in the United States figure out that it's cheaper to go abroad and engage in those services, 
And they use then women in countries like India, um, in Thailand, in parts of Mexico, uh, it basically a form of colonizing the womb, a neo-colonialism of the womb, right? Many of these women are women who are illiterate. They sign these contracts that they can't read, which are written in English with a thumbprint. And there are practices that they support or know go on that would not be tolerated in the United States. That's a matter of accountability. Why export those kinds of harms on other women abroad? And, you can, and, and I'm sorry, the, the kind of uh, cloak of sisterhood is not enough to cover that kind of usury. So that's a matter of accountability. But that, that reminds me of how valorized and sacralized adoption is in the United States. And adoption is actually, the incidence of adoption is an index of the vulnerability of women in the community who, it, because it's only, I mean, this goes back to your question, do people have the right to be a mother? And of course, we were all schooled in, um, in the 80s and the 90s that women who have children who can't give them all the advantages have no business being mothers. Um, so that's the, the kind of accountability that many white Americans in particular have swallowed, that um, we, will give a, we will create some financial test for legitimate motherhood. Yeah. And, then the, and the other test is that I can take somebody's baby um, and feel good about it. Um, I can feel that I'm rescuing um, someone's child. And there, there's a lot of moral ambiguity, if not outright immorality involved in many of these transactions. We only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to um, raise a question, maybe the elephant in the room, and I, I hope that um, you won't cause me physical harm for raising this question, but where do men fit into this story? I mean, at, when you talk about in counties where we don't have enough women, in yeah. politics, you know, we see an outcome, but a counter argument might be that um, suggests that we reduce women to um, being a, a certain way. They will uh, predictably vote a certain way. Sure. And so the larger question, yeah, so I knew this was going to happen with the <laughs> I'm not talking men being Trump, although his advocacy of paid maternity leave has, has thrown me, but, but is this something that we can Probably join there was together Trump, there was on? Thatcher, so I mean, give me a break. Mm. Men have to be involved and engaged. Men, uh, you, you, so I think it would be a mistake to say that men can't learn and be engaged, and they should be. And many men want to, right? I mean, I think it's the example that you started us off with about, um, about family leave and that being men. We need to change our own cultural norms and how we think about the role of men within the context of the family. I want to take a really quick moment to say that in 1966, Dr. King received uh, Planned Parenthood's uh, first Margaret Sanger Award. Mm -hmm. And in his speech in receiving the award, and it was a speech that was delivered by his wife because he was at a, another march and protest someplace, um, but he said that if aliens were to come from outer space and land here in the United States, they'd say that we were governed by a nation of crazy men, of insane men was the word that he used. And he said, because we spend billions of dollars on the instruments of war and not enough on family planning. And so if you think about how we can change cultural norms about men having a place and being involved in all of those spaces of the family that we said were just simply destined for women. Those are spaces that men can and should occupy, and many men actually do so. We just simply don't highlight them in the process. Okay, thank you so much. We have to leave. Oh, <laughs> me and men. Um, as a heterosexual woman, I've often had the pos pr position that I love sleeping with men, but I don't know if I want to work with them. <laughs> you know? And that's probably not fair, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, they are socialized into such sexist behavior that they serve as a distraction from trying to do the work that I really want to do, and they expect to get an A-plus if they act the slightest bit human. I mean, I just... 
and I love me some men's, <laughs> you know? And, and, but, you know, quite often I just say, can't you just shut up? Can't we just have a relationship and affair and not try to talk politics? Um, and so that's a very problematic position to be as a heterosexual woman. At the same time, I am working with a physician uh, who's an abortion provider, very famous one, but I won't out him right now, to start an organization called Black Men for Reproductive Justice. Because we do believe that until we get men to understand their stake in reproductive justice, that nothing will change. You know, but at the same time, I've got the feeling that lift is going to be much harder than starting black women for reproductive justice. And it's a real question uh, of whether or not uh, it pays its dividends. But, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a veteran of the movement to end violence against women. And our first program was started in the 1970s, Prisoners Against Rape, where we convinced, we convinced men who had been convicted of murdering and raping women that they could help build the anti-violence movement. And so I've seen the recruitment and the encouragement of, of men to get involved in this work. But I also don't want to decenter ourselves in the effort to get them involved. Mm -hmm. Because that reinforces the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Ricky, do you have any final thoughts on this? Otherwise, I know that um, we've gone past time. I <laughs> <laughs> That's so, fine. OK, I want to thank my panelists. Thank I want to thank this great you. audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks once again. That was wonderful. Well, it's taped. On behalf of the Center for Women's History, I'd like to thank Diane and Adam E. Max once again. And also our president and CEO, Louise Mirror. The trustees and staff of the New York Historical Society. And all of our panelists for their help in creating this extraordinary event. We've heard it said for over a century, but more forcefully and consistently in recent years, that women's rights are human rights. Similarly, women's history is human history, a notion we're contemplating in the many ways here at the Center for Women's History. The stories of the women of the past who breathed the same air and faced the same life's challenges as their male counterparts didn't exist in a vacuum nor do they live in a marginal place on the side. It's just that we've never entirely interpreted their experiences in a thoroughly inclusive way. And now we will, or at least we'll try to do our level best. We know as historians and as people that there is never just one truth or one story. Facts can and will be interpreted in many different ways. But historical context still matters and has real meaning for how we understand our own time. That's why free public conversations like the several we have had here over the course of today are important. They can ground our thinking and our responsibilities as citizens to be equipped with information to level the exchanges we have with our fellow men and women. There are no simple solutions or easy prescriptions, but we can work towards an understanding of what has made women empowered divided, silent, or powerless, and revel in what we have won and the strategies that have worked. Then we might move together towards a shared future where we understand the meaning of the rhetoric that proclaims that true equality means that none of us are free until all of us are free. 
My colleagues and I are so very grateful to those individuals and organizations who've made the work of the Center for Women's History possible. Thank you again, Diane and Adam Max, for your leadership support in establishing this annual scholarly conference. We also recognize Joyce Cowan for her visionary support of the new Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery and its inaugural exhibition, Saving Washington. Many thanks as well to the outstanding contributions of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Jean Margot Reed, the estate of Jean Dubinsky Appleton, our trustee Eric Wallach and his wife Daria Wallach, Deutsche Bank, Claudine and Fred Baker, the Robert D David Lyon Gardiner Foundation, the Karen Caroline M. Lowndes Foundation, and Hogan Lovells, the corporate sponsor of Women's History Public Programming. We are so grateful to these and the many, many other individuals and organizations who continue to support the Center for Women's History. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your attendance today and for your support. Please come back to the Center for Women's History here at the New York Historical Society again and again and experience women's history as an essential approach to the understanding of the past for all people. Thank you. Thank you.